Jordan Peterson can, by the lights of the current year, be regarded as one of the most prominent public figures of our time in the context of online media, and certainly as a source of inspiration for today's benighted youth. I do, in theory, appreciate his work and engagement, and his thoughts and conversations are not without merit, nor do they occasionally lack useful insights. But much of Peterson's modus operandi is driven by passion, and the natural and sometimes unfortunate child of passion can be zealotry. I am not making the claim that Peterson is in fact a zealot, at least not yet, but rather that passion can sometimes lead to blindness, and it can, and does show with Peterson on occasion, above all in matters of sex difference and his inability to see past his own proposed archetypes regarding human beings, which themselves have largely been adopted from so-called Jungian archetypes formulated by the Swiss psychoanalyst Carl Gustav Jung, a series of assumptions made by Jung without any solid scientific backing, in addition to other biases possibly associated with his desire to maintain his reputation. Symbols, metaphors, and archetypes can be useful ways of viewing the world if a certain concept or phenomenon has eluded a more direct, reductionist understanding that would otherwise be more factual and to the point, but increasingly, as man unravels the world bit by bit, and we edge more closely to a potential complete understanding of human beings, and incidentally, I am not claiming that this complete understanding is necessarily within reach any time soon, this overuse of symbols, metaphors, and the like will only serve to obfuscate and occlude easily understood facts that in their totality would comprise highly descriptive and likewise easily understood theories and explanatory models that may have a direct bearing on our society, and thus their continual employment could amount to a waste of time. Metaphorical explanatory models can often be referred to as placeholder truths. Though not explicitly metaphors, there are good examples of ancient wisdom without the accompanying knowledge that can be seen in the Bible in the prohibition against the consumption of pork, because trichinosis, a parasitic disease caused by roundworms, was likely observed to manifest itself amongst poorly kept swine, thus the proscription against the eating of swine. There is also the prohibition against the consumption of shellfish, which I would posit is related to the observation of red tide, which refers to the phenomenon of algal bloom in which algae become so numerous in count that coastal waters take on an almost reddish hue, hence the name red tide, and whereby severe oxygen depletion takes place, as well as the release of toxins that are hazardous to animals and humans. The avoidance of shellfish might well be caught up in this occurrence, for example. However, no one in the modern world requires the dictate of a celestial being to understand the reasoning for avoiding such fare. There are other, better explanations than those offered by a Canaanite storm deity in the form of interdiction. Such prescriptions and proscriptions as are found in the Bible have adaptive value in the context of evolution, but we must ask ourselves when and if such things have the same adaptive value in a contemporary setting. Let us take, for example, the archetype of the devouring mother, one that Peterson often makes reference to. This archetype encompasses the overbearing, controlling female figure, the mother who seeks to reign over her children rather than raise them under the guise of professed love. This is, of course, a very pretty, even pictorial way of describing such a person. But is it ultimately of the greatest use when other, better alternatives exist? Imagine such a person, a person afflicted by such qualities as could be attributed to a devouring mother archetype, and imagine, too, the limitation of remedies that could be proposed within that framework. What could be done to aid such a beleaguered soul? It might make for colorful description and still more colorful antidotes, but ultimately, little else. Effectively, we are dealing with the same problems I addressed in the video, the problem of philosophical course correction. We are working with antiquated theories, propositions, and solutions. The question then is, what might be deemed a more appropriate solution? If a person, for example, is suffering from manic depression and displays behavioral traits that can be likened to a devouring mother archetype, ultimately, it would be of far greater use to identify how the most salient monoamine neurotransmitters such as dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin are interacting with this person because such monoamine neurotransmitters are understood to be implicated in cases of anxiety, depression, and other psychiatric disorders. 
Are there deficits in the production of these chemicals? What exactly differentiates this person's neurochemical profile from an identifiably healthier person? These strike me as far more relevant questions than endless forays into the world of metaphors. Even now, we have limited but nonetheless applicable psychopharmacological solutions, which, although still primitive, can be improved. Imagine a world in which the specifics of a person's neurochemistry could be understood to the letter, and a tailor-made medical solution could be proposed to address problems arising from said neurochemistry. Whilst we are indeed far away from that, this world would completely vitiate the need for metaphor or archetype in addressing psychiatric problems, or even what are regarded as quote-unquote general personal problems of the sort Peterson is inclined to address, since all these problems ultimately have a neurochemical origin, whatever role the environment might play. As we are far off from such a solution, we make use of band-aid solutions that in more than theory actually have better alternatives. Similarly, there was a time when the best medicine could offer was to painfully amputate limbs in order to stop the spread of infection. Eventually anesthetic was developed and medicine progressed still further in being able to prevent the spread of infection from one part of the body to the other. I am certainly not proposing a model of absolute progress, and frankly speaking I do not believe in such, merely that one's means and methods are routinely overhauled and improved, and archaic metaphors can be subjected to the very same overhauls and improvements in the respective domains they are applied to. In this way, I believe that the wisdom or truths of old may appear timeless, but are merely stepping stones to something else, and that at some point in time, the legacy of archetypes, symbols, and metaphors as a primary means of understanding the world will have seen their time in the sun, but ultimately will be of little use in the apprehension of real-world phenomena. No matter what primitive instincts of man weigh heavily upon the matter, instincts that at once serve both to facilitate the overindulgence in this worldview and as a hindrance to better alternatives. This statement acknowledges the fact that most humans come equipped with a deep-seated need to approach the world and its constituent parts in terms of symbolism. But as I argue, it can be likened to riding a bike with training wheels versus riding a bike unfettered by such constraints, because the former imposes stricter limitations on movement and represents something akin to a beginner's model, and the latter, whilst more dangerous, allows for greater exploitation of the object in question. This is no different in matters of worldview and understanding. It might very well be that humans have prehistorically and historically been best outfitted for the training wheel model and are most receptive to it, which says nothing of its ultimate utility moving forward. Some traditions of the past are useful and remain so and others, conversely, can be regarded as artifacts of a bygone age and can be given less heed, and perhaps, eventually, none at all. The purpose of this video is twofold. In the first instance, I wish to dissect what I regard as some faulty reasoning on the part of Jordan Peterson concerning a particular manifestation of female behavior, as well as the larger backdrop of certain elements of reproductive behavior and in the second instance, I wish to address the larger issues surrounding Peterson and his acolytes. One statement I have heard Peterson make on several occasions has been that much of the interpersonal behavior on the part of females, particularly in the work environment, is mediated by the biologically ingrained inclination towards sacrifice for the sake of children, above all young infants. On the surface, this appears to be sound reasoning, but as we dig more deeply, we will see that this interpretation is likely not correct, and that there are other significant questions that arise from the hypothesis in the first place. This excerpt outlines his position rather neatly. I mean, for example, one of the things, here's, here's a biological problem. On average, women are more agreeable than men. And I think that's because agreeable people are, they're self-sacrificing. And I think as a woman, you need to be wired to be self-sacrificing or you won't be able to tolerate taking care of infants. That's my sense of it. Okay, now there's some problems with that. It's like, let's say that a huge part of female wiring is, is tilted in the direction of the necessity of self-sacrifice for infant care. Okay, that doesn't equip women very well for dealing with, with aggressive men because aggressive men and infants are not the same creatures. So women p play a, pay a price be, being optimized to some degree for infant care, they pay a price that they're less, uh, what would you call, prepared, that's one way of thinking about it, in de with dealing with hyper-aggressive and competitive men. 
Well, one of the consequences of that is that agreeable people don't make as much money. And the reason for that is to make money, you actually have to be disagreeable because you have to go to your boss and say, give me some bloody money or something you don't like will happen to you. In this statement, we find more than a few faulty lines of reasoning by my account. The first part of the statement that needs to be examined and properly taken apart is the claim that women are, by their very nature, more agreeable, and said agreeableness is rooted in the predilection for self-sacrifice in the context of infant care. On the surface, as already stated, this sounds like decent reasoning. But more than a cursory examination of the claim reveals several holes in the purported argument. There are data that suggest that, in fact, infants and young children are at greater risk of harm or death in the presence of mothers rather than fathers. I do not know to what degree these data take into account greater amounts of time spent with infants and young children, something that mothers are more likely to do, but even if not adjusted for this condition, time and proximity need not be decisive factors in ascertaining the particulars of behavior and psychology, i.e. being a dog walker, and thus in close and frequent proximity to dogs, does not render one per force more likely to be an abuser of dogs, unless there are some predefined and deep-seated attributes within the category of dog walker which predispose one to be abusive to dogs. The same would apply to mothers. Inasmuch as abuse and harm occurs to young children and infants in the presence of mothers more frequently than is the case with fathers, the causative factor would not be proximity, but rather the psychology and neurochemistry of the mothers in question. The environment and time spent in it is a mediating factor, not the primary one. With that said, if women are indeed more sacrificial than our men in the context of infant care, we would see different statistical results than the following. The DHHS, U.S. Department of Health and Human Service, calculates the percentages of perpetrators in various categories such as mother, father, foster parent, daycare staff, friend, or neighbor, etc. The percentages are often used to argue whether, on average, it is fathers or mothers that pose a greater risk of harm to their children. But when trying to determine which parent, on average, poses the greater danger, categories like foster parent, daycare staff, friend, or neighbor, etc., are entirely irrelevant. The calculations below factor out those categories to produce a more accurate picture. The resulting calculations show the percentage of child abuse and deaths caused by one parent acting either alone or in concert with someone other than the child's other parent. The DHHS data show that of children abused by one parent between 2001 and 2006, 70.6% were abused by their mothers, whereas only 29.4% were abused by their fathers. And of children who died at the hands of one parent between 2001 and 2006, 70.8% were killed by their mothers, whereas only 29.2% were killed by their fathers. Furthermore, Contrary to media portrayals that leave the viewer with the impression that only girls are ever harmed, boys constituted fully 60% of child fatalities. And evidence also suggests that mothers are more likely than fathers to be held responsible for child neglect. In a large representative study that examined the characteristics of perpetrators and substantiated cases of child abuse and neglect in the United States, neglect was the main type of abuse in 66% of cases involving a female caregiver, compared to 36% of cases involving a male caregiver. This finding is consistent with the fact that mothers tend to be the primary caregiver and are usually held accountable for ensuring the safety of children, even in two-parent families. In light of societal views on gender roles, it has been argued that this may constitute unreasonable mother blaming. These are government statistics, not my own. Overrepresentation in a particular statistic does not have to equate as I have already pointed out, to a causal factor of greater proximity and or frequency of care, as cited above. And such statistics certainly put a damper on the idea that women are, by their very nature, self-sacrificial because of the needs of infant care. If anything, men appear to display, it, at least according to statistics, greater restraint, patience, and sacrifice. And here's another citation. Did you know children are more likely to be harmed by their biological mother than father? Neither did I, until very recently. But why am I surprised, and why will you be shocked? Because we don't want to talk about it. No one wants to talk about it. Society is totally in denial that women aren't always victims. We've all been conditioned to believe that the majority of people who commit abuse are men. 
but it's not true. Data from Child Protective Services in the U.S. mirrors the pattern around the world. Of children who become victims of maltreatment, the huge majority of perpetrators of the crimes are the biological parents, not adopted or foster parents, as you might think. The Child Family Community Australia reports a British retrospective prevalence study of 2,669 young adults, age 18 to 24, found that mothers were more likely than fathers to be responsible for physical abuse, 49% of incidents, compared to 40%. Other sites that are trying to raise awareness in this area will bombard you with statistics. Breaking the Silence, for instance, says 71% of children killed by one parent are killed by their mothers. 60% of those victims are boys. A report by the Australian Institute of Family Studies released in October of 2016 found that boys were more likely to be the subjects of a substantiation of physical abuse, neglect, or emotional abuse than girls. You don't have to drown in statistics to see reality. You have only to read news headlines that are sadly all around us. The truth about violence is that it has more connection to morality than gender, and not all women are natural caretakers. But there is more to the story than infant care, and there are other examples of female behavior which would contradict a general predilection towards sacrifice for others, i.e. agreeableness. The phenomenon of war brides, which is poorly defined, but in this context refers to foreign women of defeated enemies marrying the winners in conflict, demonstrates, if anything, a willingness to not sacrifice. I am not claiming each and every woman has done this, or would do this, but it is prevalent enough to cite it as an example of a specific type of female behavior that does not support Peterson's thesis. They came to America by the thousands, from a country we had just defeated in a brutal war that lay in ruins. They were foreigners and recent quote-unquote enemies, and yet the German war brides who married Midwest soldiers and arrived in the American heartland spoke a familiar tongue, and soon fit right in. Their stories say much about Germany during the Nazi dictatorship, about the war to which fascism gave rise, and about the lives these hundreds of young German women made in the Midwest as returned soldiers' wives after the guns of war had been lowered and the bombs stopped falling. And here's another one. Seventy years ago, many Japanese people in occupied Tokyo after World War II saw U.S. troops as the enemy, but tens of thousands of young Japanese women married GIs nonetheless, and then faced a big struggle to find their place in the U.S. Or another article, Sex and the Stormtroopers, How French Women Fell for the Nazi Invaders During the Second World War. Previously unpublished pictures of French women cavorting and partying with Nazis have emerged, heaping fresh shame on the troubled wartime history of occupied France. Images showing women kissing SS officers in bars and cabarets, posing in bikinis on the beach, and enjoying strolls under the Eiffel Tower. The book, 1940-1945, Erotic Years, by historian Patrick Bisson, is set to further embarrass the French, who never forgotten life living in close quarters with the enemy under the Vichy regime. Despite more than two million Frenchmen being held in prisoner of war camps, the birth rate boomed in 1942, with an estimated 200,000 children born to Franco-German couples. Up to 30% of the births were illegitimate in some parts of Paris. And this leads me to perhaps the most salient point to be made. If women were naturally inclined, on average, towards agreeableness or self-sacrifice, divorce statistics would look vastly different. I have talked about women in divorce countless times by now, and I will be citing something very specific. Whose fault is divorce? The cold statistical answer is women. Before the hate mail barrage begins, let's clarify that rather bald statement, and yes, I was partly just trying to get your attention, it's undeniable that women request the great majority of divorces in the UK. The Office of National Statistics most recent number crunch reveals that in 2011, the woman was the party granted therefore initiating the divorce in 66% of cases that year. It used to be an even higher share, 69% in 2001, and a whopping 72% at the start of the 1990s. And, according to a recent survey of 191 CDFA professionals from across North America, the three leading causes of divorce are quote-unquote basic incompatibility, 43%, infidelity, 28%, and money issues, 22%. 
emotional and or physical abuse lagged far behind, 5.8%, and parenting issues, arguments, and addiction and or alcoholism issues received only 0.5% each. From August 1st to the 29th, 2013, 191 CDFA professionals from across North America responded to the question, according to what your divorcing clients have told you, what is the main reason that most of them are getting or have gotten divorced? A CDFA professional is someone who comes from a financial planning, accounting, or legal background and goes through an intensive training program to become skilled in analyzing and providing expertise related to the financial issues of divorce. As we know, women are universally the greater percentage of divorce initiators and filers. But along with this, and this is not unique to this particular survey, so-called basic compatibility, i.e. lack of satisfaction, is cited as the main reason. Does this bespeak a desire to take one for the team or to immolate oneself for the greater good? Is this indicative of sacrifice? None of the points raised, nor the data, suggest that in fact women are inherently self-sacrificial due to the needs of infant care, as claimed by Jordan Peterson, or for that matter, agreeable, unless you wish to define agreeable as pliant, as would be the case with these war brides. But his claims do raise interesting and debatable questions pertaining to the intersexual differences in behavior, temperament, and perhaps most interesting of all, what phase of life, the reproductive run-up to having children, or the post-child phase, should be given more weight in determining sex-specific personality traits. To the best of my knowledge, this topic has not been sufficiently explored by anyone, at least in terms of weighted percentages, in the sense of which phase has a greater impact on behavioral traits in humans. But this also allows us to speculate and hypothesize in a reasonable manner in trying to assess said weightedness of the pre- and post-child phase. To begin with, it goes without saying that, above all in women, and to a more limited degree in men, the post-birth, post-child phase introduces a number of hormonal changes, and even men's physiology is affected by having children. But what we are interested in is the specific question of which period of life has greater influence on general, sex-specific behavioral and personality traits. A question implicit in Peterson's assertion that women's alleged tendency to be more self-sacrificing and or agreeable, if using the big five personality traits, is a consequence of the post-reproductive phase of life rather than the converse, the pre-reproductive phase of life. Or in other words, everything that leads up to the reproductive act. I'm going to argue here that Peterson misses the mark with his analysis on a number of fronts, but above all in terms of assigning self-sacrifice agreeableness to a post-reproductive phase. I should add that as intimated before, it is far less a question of either or, and far more a question of scale in terms of a continuum. Behavioral traits are very rarely just one thing or the other, and thus ultimately my proposal would be that agreeableness in women is an adaptive trait that facilitates reproductive success in the main, but also might have minor benefit in the care and handling of infants, though I believe this to be far less relevant. While this sort of thing is difficult to gauge for a number of reasons, I think one can argue well the case that the most important behavioral traits found in humans will be those that lead to reproductive success, or in other words, traits and features that will improve their chances of making copies of their genes. Once DNA replication has occurred, there is another game at play. And obviously, there is adaptive behavior here too. But arguably, and I believe, more likely is the postulate that having a chance at reproductive success in the first place is more weighted than the after effect, and that any hardwired behavioral traits will be more likely to be those that lend themselves best to having a shot at reproducing rather than traits that occur in individuals after genes have been copied. As after all, what use are behavioral traits and temperament post-reproduction to an organism, human or otherwise, if said organism never reproduces in the first place, i.e. it is easier to make babies than it is to raise them, as evidenced by the spectacular failure on the part of many parents post-birth. And the natural implication of this is that most of our personality traits, be we male or female, lend themselves far more to the reproductive run-up rather than than to the reproductive run-off. In some sense, this is a chicken or the egg question, 
But I am arguing here that traits that lead to reproductive success will have to be more important than those that merely occur as a result of it, though I am not discounting that either such traits exist, simply that in terms of hierarchical and biological importance, at least for humans, anything that gives an advantage in securing reproductive success will lie higher in the hierarchy of importance, and this can be observed. To begin with, I believe that Peterson is starkly conflating a few things. One, on the part of women, that they are by their nature primarily sacrificial for the good and or agreeable due to the needs of young infants, something I have already addressed, but I find even fault in his terminology. One needn't conflate meekness and lack of assertiveness for an agreeable or self-sacrificing nature, to wit, they are far and away not the same thing. Furthermore, Peterson uses aggression and assertiveness coterminously, when in reality, although there can be some overlap, they can be very different animals indeed. One can be very self-assertive, for example, and also very much concerned for the weal of the group, using said assertive nature to achieve things for the group, sacrificing the process without any degree of quote-unquote agreeableness. They are not the same thing. No, the word he ought to have used to describe female behavior in employment situations, and more generally, is meek, as contrasted by assertive. And here, the most salient point about the aforementioned weightedness comes to the fore, because we must then ask the question, and properly ask the question, as to why women are less assertive and meeker than men, on average, whether in employment situations or not. Assertiveness, and to a lesser extent aggression, because aggression can lead to unnecessary violent conflict in a way that assertiveness would not, are useful traits to have if you are participating in a dominance hierarchy where your deeds and achievements, and consequently your status, will scale you up or down within said hierarchy. And the result of this scaling will bear directly on your chances of reproductive success, which is to say for men, it is usually not enough to merely display genetic health and beauty, but to also be able to create an environment vis-a-vis -vis the resources achieved through status to allow children to survive and grow up until they too are in a position to reproduce. Thus, observable genetic features are only part of the equation for reproductive success for a man. After all, an extremely good-looking man that otherwise has great genes but is very low in terms of the personality trait conscientiousness, will likely fail to achieve optimal outcomes in resource gathering and provisioning, and could even be outperformed by a man of lesser genetic appeal, who is nonetheless far more industrious than he is. In a not dissimilar fashion to a high IQ person of low conscientiousness, being outperformed by a person of, of greater conscientiousness, but lower IQ. It can happen, and thus deeds are as important, if not more so, in some cases than mere presentation and existence. And this is why a dominance hierarchy exists, and this hierarchy is heavily modulated by such behavioral traits as assertiveness and aggression, because the lack of such traits will disallow for an optimized climbing in said hierarchy. A man could still achieve, but he would easily be outshone by a similarly endowed man with the behavioral traits he lacks. And what about women? Most of us are aware that the tools that allow for reproductive success in men and women are different. These tools include behavioral and personality traits, and other things. Suffice to say, achievement and the accumulation of resources is not high on the list of priorities for women in order to secure reproductive success. Genetic health and beauty are the primary currency, and these things can, and will more often than not, lend the female in question the lion's share of reproductive options and thus we see different criteria. Status, resource gathering, and provision are necessary requirements in most cases for men's reproductive success, with appearance being perhaps of equal importance, but nonetheless just a part of the success equation. For women, appearance is the most salient factor by far, and with that, a decreased need for being assertive. In fact, meekness and coyness are reproductively advantageous for women, assuming they are sufficiently attractive because they will be doing the selecting from the pool of men who succeeded in the dominance hierarchy. And such traits allow for women to keep sufficient distance. And as far as personality goes, assertiveness, or as Peterson incorrectly puts it, aggression, are not attractive traits in a female, and can be repellent towards potential suitors.
If such traits had been useful in terms of achieving genetic fitness historically and prehistorically, they would be present in the same quantities we find in females as we do in males, but we do not. Agreeableness and meekness, thus, are not primarily attributes that would have arisen due to the constraints placed on mothers postpartum, but rather constraints that evolved in order to optimize reproductive success for women, whereas in men, assertiveness and boldness would have yielded greater payoffs in terms of reproductive success. And this is where Peterson, as with a few other things, is likely mistaken. Women are not by nature self-sacrificing for the common good, as evidenced by their greater intolerance for circumstances to make them unhappy, leading to much higher rates of divorce filing. In times of war, they, for reasons of survival and reproductive utility, tend to collaborate with the opposing side, if that side is a victor, rather than to go down with the ship. One good piece of evidence to show why assertiveness and truculence would be reproductively disadvantageous to women can be gleaned from tribal warfare found in the Amazon, in particular from a tribe called the Jivaro. I do not claim that the circumstances that exist in this tribe are identical to prehistorical circumstances. However, it is a reasonably close approximation compared to Western modernity. The Jivaro are even more extremely violent than the Yanomamu, having a war homicide rate of about 60% of men. Although modern changes are leading to social resolution of physical conflicts, they are renowned as the one Amazonian tribe who practiced head shrinking. They refused to be suppressed by the Inca and revolted against the Spanish Empire and thwarted all subsequent attempts by the Spaniards to conquer them. In the year 1599, the Javaros banded together and killed 25,000 white people in raids on two settlements. The attack was instigated over the natives being taxed in their gold trade. After uncovering the unscrupulous practices of the visiting governor, molten gold was later poured down his throat until his bowels burst. Following his execution, the remaining Spaniards were killed, along with the older women and children. The younger, useful women were taken as prisoners to join the clan. Like the Yanomamo, perpetual animosity exists between the neighboring tribes of the Jivaro. The Shaur and Achuar Jivaros, once deadly enemies, have only recently formed a tribal federation. Among the Jivaro, as among the Yanomamo, there is no stratification, but egalitarian warriorship. During times of peace, there is no chieftain. When wars erupt, older experienced men who have killed many men and captured many heads are chosen as war chiefs. No Jivaro can be chosen if he has not killed. Bloody feuds, reported as functioning to obtain women, are frequent and follow familial lines. A fundamental difference between wars enacted within the same tribe and against neighboring tribes is such that the wars between different tribes are in principle wars of genocidal extermination. The significant goal of these wars was geared towards the annihilation of the enemy tribe, including women and children. This was done in order to prevent them from seeking revenge against the victors in the future. There were, however, many instances where the women and children were taken as prisoners and forced to become part of the victors' families. A woman who fights, or a woman who refuses to accompany the victorious war party to their homes and serve a new master, exposes her to the risk of suffering the same fate as her menfolk. This excerpt shows that assertiveness, aggression, or resistance result in death in females who display these traits in the context of violent conflict rather than the potential of reproductive success afforded by capture and absorption into the victor's family. Given how violent our prehistory was, it is not unreasonable to posit that many such scenarios were played out over the millennia, and that over time, agreeableness and lack of aggression and or assertiveness resulted in more reproductive success in females and thus became an adaptive behavioral trait in women. Women are by their nature not more sacrificing towards infants and young children, as evidenced by the publication of government statistics showing that mothers pose a greater risk to infants and children than do fathers. Men and women have evolved different behavioral traits that tend to be underscored in one sex more than the other because the variables involved in reproductive success are different. This is part of different postpartum requirements for women, but ultimately this is less relevant to the type of temperament and behavior that will allow women to make copies of their genes, as opposed to men. At the end of the day, survival of this sort that is enabled by so-called agreeableness 
appears to be a much stronger factor than agreeableness for the sake of infants. Again, we need only think about how much easier it is to achieve reproductive success, and that most traits would be weighted in favor of being successful at making copies of our genes, rather than weighted in how to raise those copies of our genes, because that aspect of things is a much newer game. Parents stumble far more at being parents than they do in fulfilling the roles in the run-up to reproduction, because human traits, I would posit, are still better adapted to that aspect of things rather than the rearing of children, which takes an ungodly amount of time and is very difficult to navigate. This is directly tied to the fact that mammalian performance and functionality is deeply linked to the reproductive cycle. Hormonal profiles begin to decrease and decline after 25 in humans, as do other functions, and this lends credence to the ideas I am proposing, though that topic would have to be the subject of its own video. I believe that in being so passionate, Peterson has fallen into a type of tunnel vision on this particular issue by narrowly focusing on this one aspect rather than holistically looking at the entirety of variables that lie in reproductive success. All the while, falling for common myths about female nature that do not hold up in reality. We now move away from this topic to the matter of Peterson himself, who in recent times has copped a fair amount of flack in certain circles. Specifically, there were some offhand comments that Mr. Metacor had made in the live stream, were reacted to in an extremely aggressive fashion on the part of Peterson's followers, and some of the comments on display were overtly hostile. The sorts of comments and reactions ultimately bore the likeness of something cultish. For the purposes of this discussion, however, I am far less interested in what those comments were than what Peterson, as a human phenomenon, represents. It should be reasonably clear to everyone by now that Peterson is effectively a substitute father figure to the many, and in some ways, a messianic figure. But more to the point, if we think about it, most of today's youth finds itself in the situation of single motherhood, not even literally, but in the sense that the paternalism that formerly characterized our society has largely disappeared. And this is but one element of a greater problem. To understand how this came to pass, we must understand the current state of affairs in the youngest generation. In no small manner, the early 21st century is a continuation of the problems of the 20th, which is to say that a nagging and oft-repeated question that arises from Nietzsche's postulate that God is dead, if God is dead, wither humanity, well, the mountains of corpses that have checkered the landscape of the 20th century are in many ways an attempt at answering the question, one failed utopian dream after the other, and all these things only resulted in conflict, death, and destruction, although I know some people might vociferously disagree with that assertion. Towards the end of the 20th century, civilized man, with a few exceptions, largely gave up striving for utopian dreams that could only be achieved by the implementation of mass violence. The price? Whether this was the conscious or unconscious calculus of man was deemed too high. A new utopian ideal came about as a consequence, one that had already been in place throughout much of the 20th century, which was the ideal of a paradise of physical comfort and endless material sustenance. And this paradisaical ideal was and is a reasonable one. As for much of our history, the struggle to simply exist materially and survive was in fact our greatest struggle and greatest challenge. Indeed, I do not even believe the perpetuation of this ideal is even conscious, but rather an extension of the human desire to survive. And suddenly, very suddenly, we were surrounded by high-definition TV screens, dumb phones, computers, giant metal birds that flew us to exotic places, nigh unlimited quantities of food, and perhaps the most incredible bit of all, the internet. One would think that humanity would be in its best state possible, yet a cursory glance cast out at our world tells otherwise. It is arid. Some things are better, yet other things are not, and into this vortex of endless material comfort and the simultaneous lack of what could only be summarized as a spiritual comfort, the current generation has been born, a generation without education of the past, little to no knowledge of the world, and on average, the complete inability to self-reflect. Mr. Metacore might have puzzled at people's need to take a personality test created by Jordan Peterson for $10, but this does not surprise me at all. This generation is completely lost at sea, 
with neither sail nor paddle nor star to guide them anywhere. Is it any surprise, then, that Peterson has operationalized himself as such a powerful and influential force in their lives? He's well-read, educated, and assertive, all attributes thoroughly lacking in the generation of comfort, as I have come to call him. And whatever the intricacies of his message and his guidance, the single, most salient factor in said message has almost nothing to do with its contents, but can be boiled down to, do as I say, and all shall be well. In being everything that his adherents are not, he's achieved an otherworldly status in their eyes. Yes, Peterson doles out advice. Yes, he suggests reading lists. And yes, he has his own personality test to better enable his acolytes to make their beds. But most important in all of this is the virtual certainty with which he presents himself and his message, and it is this self-assuredness that grants him dominion over the masses who will graft themselves onto anything with even the slightest whisper of the promise of salvation. Maps of meaning, Dostoevsky, Jung, almost none of this matters in terms of understanding what the actual needs of Peterson's de facto children are. They need saving from themselves. And he is the person, is purported by the implication of their subscription to his words, to do so. And woe betide those who do not yield to this vision. They have sinned in the eyes of the Father. And herein lies the great irony, of course. For a man who spends inordinate amounts of time speaking of the virtues of individualism, his acolytes do a piss-poor job reenacting such virtues, as has been demonstrably shown in their reaction to a few desultory comments made by Mr. Medicor and elsewhere revealing themselves to be as unreflective, sectarian, and robotic as any fanatic of a more typical religion. Such people are, by dint of their upbringing, their lack of education, and their desperation, largely incapable of the very individualist philosophy that Peterson advocates because they lack the intellectual capital required to be such. He is their father in his artful guidance of them, but in terms of symbolism, as acolytes of Peterson or want to cleave to, he is their messiah. And like any religious fanatic who is confronted by doubt cast upon his religion from the outside, this doubt is met by rejection, scorn, hostility, and at times violence to reassure the devotee of the rectitude of his cause and the infallibility of the being he worships. Peterson is not but a man, but his children are incapable of scrutinizing him as such because they are just that, children. There is no child's rebellion against the father. They cannot see when he might be wrong, or even if he is capable of being wrong. Effectively, we are dealing with a soteriological problem. Soteriology is traditionally the study of the religious doctrines of salvation, taken from the Koine Greek soteria. And the fundamental issue afflicting the modern world is that there is no longer any fixed soteriological pathway. Unlike previous centuries, there is no great hope for the beyond, nothing to work towards. Instead, there are myriad pathways branching off into this world, each purportedly offering succor and the way to a better life, each claiming to be better than the other, with each one ending up disappointing the person, forcing him to move on to the next salvific fix, only for that one to fail, and so it goes until the human's pitiful life ends. Peterson is, seen in this light, just another fix du jour, another tourist destination for the lost travelers of the current year. Yet few question the very nature of seeking salvation itself, and the common flaw in every redemptive proposal made. I would agree with Jordan Peterson that the human condition is fundamentally tragic, but where I disagree with him is why the human condition is tragic, and that actual solutions are within reach, because each traditional and conventional solution offered follows a predictable pattern of cultural modification. In former times, gradual cultural modification had adaptive value, and provided many advantages. But in the 20th century, we began hitting hard limits on the ability of cultural modification to provide tangible solutions to human problems in modernity. Why? Because of maladaptation. If we regard cultural input as software, and bodies and brains as hardware, we can begin to see where the mismatch lies. Technology and its consequences, what I have often labeled the mechanization effect, have irreversibly and irrevocably changed the nature of culture, from phones to cars to supermarkets, to more profound alterations such as birth control and the influence of the internet. The software packages we are running 
are quite simply light years ahead of the outdated and primeval hardware that keeps us going. This results in massive incompatibilities in the game we are trying to run, and this game is our lives. A more direct analogy would be attempting to run The Witcher 3 on Mac settings with NVIDIA Hairworks enabled on an i386 processor and a GTX 480. It's not happening. And the problem is that software cannot upgrade hardware. Let me repeat that. Software cannot upgrade hardware, which means that no amount of culture, i.e. software, will be able to upgrade our hardware, i.e. our neurophysiology, in order to properly run our lives, i.e. our game. This is not to say that software cannot modify hardware. For example, there is a software utility called CCleaner, which cleans out junk data that accumulate over time, thus enabling space on the hard drive. Note, the maximum capacity of the hard drive cannot be increased this way. Only pre-existing space that had been occupied is freed. For the hard drive to have a greater storage capacity, one would need to swap or upgrade that piece of hardware. We are now foundering upon the limitations of our cultural modification programs. For untold millennia, cultural software upgrades have been slow, purposeful, and tolerable, and largely worked with our evolved hardware. But we are already at a time when this is no longer the case. Imagine proposing the medieval trivium and quadrivium as a game plan for running the complex net of communication, financial markets, and technology that is shot through our modern world. It simply would not work anymore. Our neurophysiology is fundamentally maladapted to the cultural technological landscape we have created for ourselves, and no amount of revamping or rehashing of ideas is going to save us this time. There is no salvation. Yet unironically, we are moving ever more closely to a time when we might actually be able to upgrade our hardware instead of merely modifying it via endless waves of cultural software packages. But this time is still reasonably far removed, and it should be clear that continually looking for solutions that fall within the purview of philosophical course correction, i.e. cultural modification, will fail us, and they will fail us all the more spectacularly if we continue to neglect certain key elements that are vital to understanding what is particularly wrong with our software. And Peterson is remiss in only partially touching upon these elements. And this is actually contributing to the problem as much as it is helping. These elements encompass a variety of topics, but they all fall within the category of basic human biology, neurology, human biodiversity, and sex differences. Now, of course, Peterson has talked about sex differences, but as I pointed out earlier, I do not believe he examines this area as critically as he could be doing. Moreover, he has spoken of the importance of IQ as a correlative value to success in life. This is important, but he does not go further, or should I say, dares not go further. And finally, he completely ignores matters of HBD and the distinct possibility and increasingly likely case that not only does variance across populations exist, but that this variance, in aggregate, may well have an impact on society at large and may not be compatible with his own professed philosophy of individualism. Instead, he skirts around many of these issues. I cannot claim to know why he does this. Perhaps it is ignorance. Perhaps it is his desire to maintain a sterling reputation in the eyes of the public. Or perhaps it is something else entirely. But I can claim that he is in error in not making full use of the data available on these subjects and the intended potential consequences that might result from understanding these data. In the not-so-distant future, we may well be able to finally upgrade our hardware and escape the pit of obsolescence our own technological and cultural progress has thrust us into by aligning our neurophysiology with our prospective culture and environment, such that we can run the game we call our lives. But there is still much time to go. Until we are actually there, pussyfooting around critical issues that are integral to our hardware upgrade and offering antiquated software solutions as to why we feel so empty and lost is not going to help, but only hinder. And I feel that Peterson is doing little in this way, instead promoting just another batch of recycled cultural modifications and ideas from the days of yore in the vain hope that this will bring the relief and salvation his children 
the generation of comfort so desperately craves. The very ideas that managed to fail us so spectacularly in the not-so-distant past, precisely because their proponents failed to apprehend just how incoherent those ideas were in a modern, mechanized world of mass migration. There is no salvation. There never was, and never will be. But we can, at least potentially, facilitate a rapprochement between our hardware and software if we take these matters of human nature into account, be they sex-related, population-related, or anything else, when trying to shape the world we live in, and we move towards the possibility of escaping the maladaptive trap we have created for ourselves. If we fail, it will be game over, with no respawn, and Peterson, however else his children and acolytes might feel, has done nothing to pave the way towards this goal, which is likely the only way we will ever be able to escape from ourselves. You can clean your room, after all, a thousand times, but if the contents of your room do not change, then all you are is a broken record, doomed to failure and repetition. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.